Hey guys, Phil Freedom here with another book for you. This one is a classic. This one is Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. This book uh, is life changing, could be. You know, this is um, critical of the entire education system and then teacher student relationships. I'll get into it right here. The first chapter, page 26. Dehumanization, which marks not only those whose humanity has been stolen, but also, though in a different way, those who have stolen it. It is a distortion of the vocation of becoming more fully human. This distortion occurs within history, but it is not an historical vocation. Indeed, to admit of dehumanization as an historical vocation would lead either to cynicism or total despair. The struggle for humanization, for the emancipation of labor, for the overcoming of alienation, for the affirmation of men and women as persons would be meaningless. This struggle is possible only because dehumanization, although a concrete historical fact, is not a given destiny, but the result of an unjust order that engenders violence in the oppressors, which in in turn dehumanizes the oppressed and over here the education as long as their ambiguity persists the oppressed are reluctant to resist and totally lack confidence in themselves they have a diffused magical belief in the invulnerability and power of the oppressor the oppressed must see examples of the vulnerability of the oppressors so that a contrary conviction can begin to grow within them until this occurs they will continue disheartened, fearful, and beaten. As long as the oppressed remain unaware of the causes of their condition, they fatalistically accept their exploitation. Further, they are apt to react in a passive and alienated manner when confronted with the necessity to struggle for their freedom and self-affirmation. Little by little, however, they tend to try out forms of rebellious action. In working towards liberation, one must neither lose sight of this passivity nor overlook the moment of awakening. Let's see, we're here to chapter two, banking. In the banking concept of education, knowledge is a gift bestowed by those who consider themselves knowledgeable upon those whom they consider to know nothing, projecting an absolute ignorance onto others, a characteristic of the ideology of oppression, negates education and knowledge as processes of inquiry. Those truly committed to liberation must reject the banking concept in its entirety, adopting instead a concept of women and men as conscious beings, and consciousness as consciousness intent upon the world. They must abandon the educational goal of deposit making and replace it with the posing of the problems of human beings and their relations with the world. Problem posing education, responding to the essence of consciousness, intentionality, rejects, communiques, and embodies communication. It epitomizes the special characteristics of consciousness, being conscious of, not only as intent on objects, but as turned in upon itself in a Jasperian split, consciousness as consciousness of consciousness. Let's see here. This is page 76. This task implies that revolutionary leaders do not go to people in order to bring them a message of salvation, but in order to come to know through dialogue with them both their objective situation and their awareness of that situation, the various levels of perception of themselves and of the world in which and with which they exist. One cannot expect positive results from an educational or political action program which fails to respect a particular view of the world held by the people. Such a program constitutes cultural invasion. Good Intentions notwithstanding. And let's see, way over here, towards the end. Cultural invasion is on the one hand an instrument of domination and on the other the result of domination. Thus, cultural action of a dominating character, like other forms of anti-dialogical action, in addition to being deliberate and planned, is in another sense simply a product of oppressive reality. For example, a rigid and oppressive social structure necessarily influences the institutions of child rearing and education within that structure. These institutions pattern their action after the style of the structure and transmit the myths of the latter. Homes and schools, from nurseries to universities, exist not in the abstract, but in a time and space within the structures of domination. They function largely as agencies which prepare the invaders of the future. The parent-child relationship in the home usually reflects the objective cultural conditions of the surrounding social structure. If the conditions which penetrate the home are authoritarian, rigid, and dominating, the home will increase the climate of oppression. As these authoritarian relations between parents and children intensify, children in their infancy increasingly internalize the paternal authority. 
Uh, that's about time for me. I wanted to say a few more things. In order for the oppressed to unite, they must first cut the umbilical cord of magic and myth which binds them to the world of oppression. The unity which links them to each other must be of a different nature. To achieve this indispensable unity, the revolutionary process must be, from the beginning, cultural action. The methods used to achieve the unity of the oppressed will depend on the latter's historical and existential experience within the social structure. Um, I mean, there's more. There's so much more to this book. I highly recommend it. There, there's just too much here to get over in just, you know, five minutes. But, um, again, this is uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed by Paulo Freire. I'm Phil Freedom. Thanks, y'all. Peace.